Ben, we are back and we have in this draft the 105. So I got my dream sequence here where all three drafts from the top five slots. Three straight top five slots after you said to me before the show that you had not been getting any in the top five. We're hoping I bring you some good luck. Here we go. That's all I get is top five picks. We're up already. The top four went in order. Jamar Chase off the board. You have Amon Ra ranked ahead of Justin Jefferson. You want to pound the table for that? No. Do you have a preference? I would probably just take the guy who's like the greatest receiver of our generation. (laughs) (laughs) Does it concern you that he's also absent for the start of OTAs? Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not thrilled. I'm not like super high on JJ McCarthy's profile. There's a lot of things that are not great, but he's also Justin Jefferson. So there's Does that. it concern you that we have already taken JJ McCarthy at least what do we take him in both drafts today? No. We only took him once. Um and I've got a lot of JJ we... McCarthy today, so we don't need to take him again. We could just take Jefferson, and that can be our, our. We don't have to build out the Vikings thing. We like J- Jefferson can get there on his own without any kind of stacks or necessary. He could play in a really boring Week 17 game and still catch nine balls for 150 yards, right? I mean, it's. I don't think you have to stack your early guys. I always think about the correlation stuff in the later rounds, where it's like, that's where I want to boost the player, his expected projection by the game situation and and all of those things and and his season long projection by the team level correlation stuff that you're doing. Okay. Well, I've already bet on this player. Then I guess it boosts this player. That would be fair for the McCarthy case where you say, well, if you've already bet on Jefferson, it probably brings McCarthy into play as a decent late round pick, but I don't think it's necessary to do anything with Jefferson correlation wise. If you start with him, you can just say, he, I mean, he's very capable of having an incredible season without there really being that much, excitement for the Vikings is there any sort of corresponding concern about Amon Ra being able to post you know early mid first round value with a second season now from Sam Laporta with Jameer Gibbs maybe being you know the second coming of Christian McCaffrey and with even Jamison Williams generating some pretty strong reviews yes yeah, I mean, I love Amon Ross St. Brown. We were really in on him last year, Sean. I, He's a guy I think I had ranked as like the, the 106 last year early before really I think a lot of people did. He ended up moving up into that range. I was really, really excited about him. Had a lot of exposure to him. Loved to have an exposure to him. I think he's a little bit overpriced actually based on everything you just said. I think it's tricky to imagine him dominating the volume, I do think the Lions are going to be really good. There's going to be a lot of like a lot of positivity there, but Laporta and Gibbs, and then especially if Williams does something, it's a lot. And they're going to run the ball. They like to run the ball when they get out ahead. They're going to David Montgomery is going to touch the ball a lot. You know, I mean, it's going to be a lot of names in there. I still think Aubin Ross out a clear first round pick, but he's tricky for me. We're back up. Your boy Devontae Adams went one pick ahead of us. I know you're whew, super upset. <laughs> I'm relieved that I don't have to defend passing on him again. I kind of think that Nico Collins is pretty exciting here as a ceiling it. play, but I'm also good with Brandon Ayuk. Nope. Let's go, Nico. He just signed Sean as we're recording this series of drafts. A three year, $72.75 million extension. 52 million guaranteed about 24 million per year is what I'm seeing. Um, which seemed like that was coming when they traded for digs and they negotiated digs down to a one year deal that Nico would then get the extension that I think usually ends up kicking in. Like it's not going to make his cap hit in 2024 massive. It'll end up kicking in down the road. Obviously, Stroud's going to eventually need a huge contract. And so I think the Texans, they brought in Diggs for this one-year run. They're not going to pay him long-term. They're not going to be able to pay this whole passing game long-term. Um, but this is a rookie QB window swing on Diggs. 
but the Nico extension is a, a positive affirmation on that theory, which is that like Nico's their long-term wide receiver one. That's the guy that they really like three plus yards per route run last year. Fantastic season in Stroud's first year and a good round two pick to just bet into this offense. Uh, we're back up Malik neighbors chilling there at 29. I mean, it's it's definitely him. Okay. <laughs> you also have Devonta Smith in the queue. I think we're both thinking that we've already drafted him twice today. But in this particular case, Devonta Smith, whose ADP is you know behind neighbors, really the only other guy that we'd consider. I agree with your case earlier in one of our earlier drafts, Sean, about DK Metcalf here. Michael Pittman's in this range. I think he's a really hard click. I think you'd have to go all the way down to like Cooper Cup. Derrick Henry's in this range. I've taken some Derrick Henry, but like when he falls 10 picks behind ADP, I've taken him at like pick 41-ish. I remember being like, okay, well, I'll get it on Derrick Henry at pick 41 in this offense where Gus Edwards ran for 13 TDs last year. You're basically saying he's going to be a better version of Gus Edwards. I think he can be that at age 31 or whatever he is pretty easily. But I don't want to take him over Malik Neighbors. Um, and he does go 33. And the and the, the picks following us were Metcalf, Devonta Smith, Cooper Cup, and Derrick Henry. I think I think you have to take Neighbors over all of those guys. I mean, you just have to. And I really like Derrick Henry there, but I do agree that you would have to take Malik Neighbors first. Is there any thought? The other player that I have ranked actually in that range is Zay Flowers with a rank of 29. His ADP is 38. He's not going to come back. Is there any element of thinking that you want to have some teams with Nico Collins? Do you think that potentially Collins is expensive enough later in draft season that you actually end up kind of pairing that naturally with Flowers? Once Collins gets up into that you know 203 range, then certainly it falls more naturally yeah. to have Or Flowers up. comes up. If if Collins was like a two oh six pick, Flowers is going three oh seven. I mean, they could they could pair up. It's an interesting point. Yeah, I mean, right now it would be very unique if this was a not best ball mania. If it was one of the other contests that's going to close, I think it would be something worth pursuing because it would be so unique. But what we just did take taking Collins in the middle of the second round from an uh, the one oh five. And then potentially, you know, some people might might do exactly what you're describing. If you take Collins high enough to then pull flowers up. But no, that's, a, I mean, that's certainly an interesting thought. Do you like Tank Dell there at all? I don't. I, I think I'm going to be like fairly anti-Tank Dell relative to you guys. You and, and Pat and Peter are really into him too. We've taken him a I think on both of our last couple ship chasing drafts. Um, Blair had a very aggressive rank on him as well. And we took him early in that draft as well. He's a good, um, he's a good play, I guess. So I'm not saying I'm like, I'm not, I've, I've drafted him in a lot of my own slows. Like I'm drafting him. I'm not saying I'm actually anti, I was saying anti relative to what I'm in. Uh, what feels like an aggressive ranks from everyone around me. I, I just, I, I see it as and we're back on the clock. We'll, we'll finish up this Houston conversation in a sec. I like, really like T Higgins here. I really like, uh, you know, Kincaid or anything, but you, you have Higgins starred. He's the ADP pick at wide receiver. It's kind of a no brainer for me. We talked in the last draft. Once he goes, once he goes, once tank Dell goes, once Zay flowers goes at that turn, the three, four turn it's George Pickens and it's Amari Cooper. And that's a big drop off for me at that point. Once Pickens is the top wide receiver, Dell clearly on the, on the good side of that group, I'm not trying to dog him, but I do think that like, so Nico Collins was more than a full yard better in, in yards per route run last year. He's bigger. He's like a more natural, um, whatever X receiver, you know, downfield guy. I know, I know Dell plays a different role. I don't know all the, you know, the wide receiver role usage stuff, but they both had similarly uh, deep eight dots. I still think about it in terms of depth of target, their target profile in terms of depth was similar. 
Nico, after Dell got hurt, Nico went on to be very, very good as the only guy, even though he was drawing a ton of a defensive attention. I just think he's very good. Um, I, I kind of think Tank was sort of working off of Nico. Whereas I, I know people pointed out to me that Tank's numbers were really strong when they were both on the field together, but I'm basically saying that he was getting open for some splash plays because of the number one receiver, the more traditional number one receiver drawing more coverage or, or whatever, however you want to frame that. Stroud elevating as well. Tank Dell has a great rookie year. We we know that a, a really efficient rookies are good year two bets. But Nico Collins, to me, was just a lot better last year in some. I can see why, like, when we think about it from a, a holistic perspective, like somebody like Blair, for example, who has done such great work on rookie efficiency and year two volume. We're back up here, middle around five, and Andrews and Kincaid went the two picks ahead of us. Man, that's It was tough. so close. It was so close. Last draft, when Kincaid went one pick ahead of us, we went worthy over Andrews. This time, we don't even have the Andrews thing. We can definitely go worthy again. I'd be fine with Pitts here too, Sean, if you wanted to go all the way down to there. Ooh, let's go ahead and try that. We'll get a little bit different flavor to this draft and maybe one, and probably not. I was going to say maybe one of these three receivers will come back through. I don't think that that will be the case. And there is a pretty big drop off after yeah. those players. And maybe George Kittle would have come yeah. back, but I'm actually fine with taking Kittle and Pitts together. This is a fun team. I mean, Ben, this is four wide receiver to start. We almost pulled the trigger on five. This feels very good. It definitely does. This is a great start. Justin Jefferson, Nico Collins, Malik Neighbors, T. Higgins, Kyle Pitts. It's early on on Pitts by ADP, but I'm very comfortable like within a, an individual draft, making sure you get that tight end when you haven't taken any detours. They've gone four. I mean, this is what I've said a few different times is I think is the the optimal way to start is to go four straight receivers, get your fourth receiver prior to that Higgins drop off and then probably go tight end in five. If you can get it all to, to work, you know, cost effectively where you can get a Higgins in the fourth and still get like a Kincaid in the fifth, that's the real home run. But um, this is a pre pretty tremendous thing, but um, just to wrap up the, the Texans thing, just, just thinking that Nico, um, I, I was saying like, I, I can see where tank as a, as a really efficient rookie looks like a really strong year two bet. And Nico as a guy who it took until his third year to, to really break out, he was good in his first two years. Um, he like from a long view perspective, doesn't look as sexy, but just like really hyper focusing on 2023 is where I wind up. And it's maybe wrong, but is where I wind up being like Nico over tank fairly comfortably and then the dig stuff where like he still earned a ton of volume last year for all four years in buffalo hasn't lost the ability to be like a, a, a volume hog we took him in an earlier draft i know you think that's certainly a possible path for him i tend to think this is going to be like digs and nico as like two legit receivers and then tank kind of working off of that and having efficiency but being a step down volume wise and that's the sort of the concern, especially because he's more of a role playing, um, like physically is not as big or, or menacing, or maybe they'd be worried he can hold up. And so they're, they're more because of his size using him situationally and some of those things. So anyway, we'll see how that plays out. I could be completely wrong, but I do think tank should be going behind legit who, what I think are two legit number ones. I don't know if Tank could be a legit number one in a different offense. Yeah, as you say that, and as you kind of work through it, it's just always the thing where you come back to, I mean, I think that CJ Stroud is undervalued. I mean, he should be going ahead of Lamar Jackson. And that's despite the fact that, I mean, we all know how Lamar Jackson scores and what the hybrid value is there. It was interesting in this draft because he was taken off the board one pick ahead of the Diggs drafter. Certainly didn't come back around to us. We get Kenneth Walker at a bit of a discount here, and I think that he is a potential star in 2024. But Adunze also interesting. Do you have a preference? No, we can go Walker. Um, I've taken Walker at behind ADP, similarly to what you said on the last 
draft. If there's running backs in this range, I'm going to take it's it, it typically ends up being Walker. Cause you don't see like a James cook fall very far. I haven't taken cook yet because it's so hard structurally. Um, might need to force myself to a little bit because I do think he could be a, a decent pick in this range. You mentioned him in the last one, but uh, Walker I've taken a few times as a, a young player who's shown some efficiency, a little bit of boom bust, but certainly somebody that can start your running back build and be a pretty solid anchor. Even in round six, we have the four receivers, the tight end Kittle did not make it back. None of those other receivers made it back. It was a Dunes or Addison. And we've gone Addison JSN two straight drafts. Is Addison going to come all the way back to 77? We're two picks away. His ADP is 69.2. And I mean, it seems plausible that we're going to be going Jefferson Addison and then taking JJ McCarthy. (laughs) I knew you wanted to get me some more McCarthy there. It is interesting because. Oh, we get a timeout here. It's going to end up being Addison. It's not. It's Keon Coleman. He must have put Coleman in his queue. He ran out of time and got Keon Coleman ahead of Addison. After we had the drafter out of one get sniped on CJ Stroud, they then take Joe Burrow empty ahead of ADP. So that part is interesting. So we're back here with I mean, JSN. <laughs> Again, available. The Christian Watson plays. Went. We we could take JSN. We have Walker. Um, I I'll, I also consider Rasheed Rice in these ranges, and I I take some Deontay Johnson in this range. Who you? I don't think have put in the queue before, but we get uh, JSN for the third time, Sean. I was faking that I was he trying did to the play. thing like he was Rasheed trying Rice. to move Rasheed Rice up. He got he somehow clicked his name and moved him up one spot, but not two spots. He got him ahead of Christian Watson, but not ahead of JSN in the queue. It's unfortunate that you didn't get to drag him all the way up to the top there. It just it seems pretty suspicious. Is kind of my <laughs> thought on that. Yeah, I, it looked fake. It looked like you were you were really trying to give a good effort. That was fantastic. So we have Justin Jefferson, Nico Collins, Malik Neighbors, T. Higgins, Kyle Pitts, Kenneth Walker, and Jackson Smith and Jigba through seven rounds. Pretty typical build, I would say. Uh, the five receivers through seven, an elite tight end, an anchor running back. It's good. Would that have been Joe Burrow for you in this draft if he had made it there? Um, you could have talked me into it. Yeah. I, I, the seventh round has been a big receiver round for me. I take JSN a ton. I take Rasheed Rice a ton and I've taken, I've forced myself to click Deontay Johnson some because I take those other two so much. I really don't take much else in the seventh round. Once Kittle's off the board, I'm not going tight end. Usually I've not taken a lot of Evan Ingram. I'm not taking uh, running backs in this range. Um, and the only back that went in all of round seven was Jonathan Brooks with the last pick. The Burrow pick, because his ADP is right there in the middle of round seven. I, I have done it with Chase, but I think I did it where he fell to eight. I think it's tough before the end of that tier of running, of receivers. This is really like the close of the wide receiver window in some respects. And then you have that veteran group that I do think you can tack on the Sutton Lockett, Curtis Samuel, Mike Williams group. You didn't seem as thrilled about the Curtis Samuel, Mike Williams plays, but I'm, I'm willing to make those bets a little bit. Um, Do you have any interest in what was, so obviously Rishi Rice was the name that I was, trying to drag up there to give us a little bit of variety christian watson though playing off of justin jefferson in week 17 was that something that was interesting you at all i couldn't have taken him over those guys i will take him once those guys go off the board some i've taken him a couple times i'm not really the biggest christian watson guy anyone who's been reading ceiling signals the last couple years knows that but i could take him some um i wouldn't i i don't i 
for me, it's too big of a tear break to be taking him over JSN or Rasheed Rice just for correlation. Yeah, I think we're almost back to, up. You would have to be be comfortable betting on sort of a re breakout in in his direction. Right. So we are back up. Um, Bowers is your guy by rank, and I'm definitely comfortable going that direction. Here at 92, we could also go Jalen Warren, which I think makes a lot of sense. So it's nice to be able to get Warren a couple picks after ADP. He is. Let me see where. So Najee Harris was actually also available, which is kind of mm-hmm. interesting. He's also after ADP. People aren't betting on the Steelers running backs in this round. We also could have taken Zach Moss. That's somebody we have talked about. I I really like getting Warren there. Yeah, I'm I definitely am comfortable picking Warren. I touched on ship chasing last week with Pat about Warren versus DeAndre Swift, who went one pick ahead of us. I think Swift is Swift, who was tough last year, Sean. I know, but I think he's mispriced by a couple of rounds because of the way that well, the Bears gave him a lot of money, but in addition to that, they, not only did they give him a lot of money for this year, the vast majority of his 2025 money is, is fully guaranteed. He's going to be their starter. He's going to play if they bench him this year. I mean, uh, I've, I've seen people kind of make vague reference to what happened with Miles Sanders with the Panthers. They gave him a, you know two years of guarantees, and then he still got benched in year one. You see what that has created for the Panthers. They can't cut him, and they have like this kind of annoying situation at running back. They want to go draft their new running back of the future, but they still have Miles Sanders hanging around. Most teams don't do that. Like That's the rare outcome. Swift, by giving him two years, I think is pretty locked into a pretty solid 2024 role where he should get both sides of the high-value touch equation like better. He should catch more balls and get more goal line work without the Jalen Hurts tush-push stuff. Oh, Sean. Brock Bowers. Didn't make the same it. drafter who took Dalton Kincaid one pick ahead of us and Jordan Addison after he slid takes Brock Bowers one pick ahead of us. Um, can you switch over to the other screen? We have 10 seconds on the clock and I don't even know. Oh, you wanted to see who our possible yeah. picks were? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you got Jane Daniels at the top of the queue. I'm fine. That's that's great. We can go that direction. Um because we have pits, so it does the Washington Atlanta thing. It's a fairly straightforward week seventeen thing. We did Daniels in the last draft. We could have went running back. We went Warren in the in the last round. I guess in hindsight, probably just take Bowers over over Warren because you know there's going to be some type of running back coming back. Yeah, I don't know that you're you need to take the guys who are my favorites here by ADP it's Tony Pollard. He seems, I mean, you can make the contract argument with him, which is obviously what his ADP is based on. He's not nearly as good as Spears. So that part I think is a little odd, although, you know, you could take him way below ADP right here and get your shares of him. One of the reasons to pass on Bowers there is just to, you know, manage kind of where you are with the price a little bit, where you are with your exposures a little bit, but Certainly once we took Pitts, I didn't want to miss on Jaden Daniels. So that's kind of the consolation there where once Bowers is gone, I mean, now we have the guy who's going to finish as, is it going to be QB2 behind CJ Stroud? How is this going to work out? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm looking up Tony Pollard's contract since you said that. I have not taken Pollard yet. I'm sitting here making a big DeAndre Swift contract case. And I think that's an intriguing potential um, disconnect. The The big difference for me is in my own analysis, the, the big difference for me is that I want to be invested in the bears. I think the bears have the best three. Like I, on our last show, Sean, I think you mentioned that the Seahawks might have the best three receivers in the NFL with TK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett and JSN. And they're very, very good. But I mean, I've, you know, this, I've, I've long been really high on Keenan Allen, as you have, I've long been very high on DJ Moore. I like Roma Dunze quite a bit. I think the bears have, and then we have Cole Komet in the mix. We have Caleb Williams at quarterback. I think they have a very good offense. 
and I think you want the running back in that offense. I'm far less convinced that Will Levis is going to create a good situation for whoever the running back is there. But Pollard's contract also not really on the same page as Swift's, I don't think. The guaranteed money is quite a bit lower. Anyway, um, I do think. So yeah, I think the argument in terms of you know why those guys are going where they're going is because they've made this more recent commitment to Pollard and they paid him, which at the running back position is always somewhat meaningful. I still am strongly skeptical of it when you have a young player who was just so much better last season. Why would you just simply not take the cheaper guy almost all of the time? Mm -hmm. We're back up. Uh, Mike Williams is still floating around there, Sean. Could be our wide receiver six behind ADP. I know you're not a fan of him. We don't have anything that's kind of set up for that, whereas Mitchell goes off of neighbors. You still prefer Williams? I'm fine with going Williams. We can do... You can do Mitchell off of neighbors. That's fine. I don't, I mean, you have a really low rank on Mike Williams. I'm not trying to make you draft him. We take 80 Mitchell there. Another reason I like taking Williams is it opens up Aaron Rodgers as a an option. Um, he's not like an easy play. I am curious why you have him ranked where you do, which is pretty low. He's always been a guy that you've argued doesn't create separation, needs to be thrown open and those types of things. But that's been like what Rodgers has been able to do throughout most of his career. I feel like there's a pretty good quarterback fit here for him. And we're paying a lot cheaper prices than we've ever had to pay for Mike Williams. People have always over overvalued his skill set. But in the 10th round and in a situation where – um. You know, I look at what Rodgers did for Christian Watson in his rookie season, and I think a lot of that has to do with Rodgers seeing one-on-ones, throwing away from defenders into one-on-ones, letting athletic players make plays down the field. Loves to do the back shoulder stuff, loves to do a lot of those things that Mike Williams has always been pretty good at the catch point on those types of plays. I think he's going to have usable weeks, man. I do. So this may not be the right way to look at it, but I actually was somewhat enthusiastic about Mike Williams earlier, but I did think he needed to be like a very clear cut number two, Hmm. even if there's not a lot of stylistic overlap when they go out there and pick Malachi Corley at number 65 and then talk about how they really consider taking him even much earlier. Yeah. I don't think that Corley is a good pick either in reality or in fantasy, but it did add some skepticism for me on like what Williams overall target um, generating situation could really be for this season. So one of the things we have here is Higgins and the Jerry Judy, like mild connection. Do you like that? Or do you like the running backs? Um, We could do that. We could do either. We're out of time. You, I would have, you you didn't have Sharbs starred. You had Marshawn Lloyd at the tar- top of the queue. Oh, because we have Kenneth Walker. That kind of threw me off. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Charbonnet was the top available running back. Marshawn Lloyd, Kendra Miller. But we were at pick 125. We like those guys. Um, They have ADPs of 144 and 145, 20 picks later. Probably if you want to get them both, you got to start taking them here. But um. We take Judy there as a wide receiver seven already. Only have the one tight end. And one quarterback and two running backs. So Ben, I know we talk about this a lot, but we're right back into the situation where I love the build because it gives us so much flexibility here. We only have the one QB and the one tight end. And they certainly weren't the most expensive QB or tight end in the draft, but I love the upside for those guys and what it can do both from a scoring perspective and possibly a roster spot saving perspective. We certainly are now into the range where we're going to have to hit that running back position, but I do like the fact that even at running back, right? The two guys that we have in Kenneth Walker and Jalen Warren, I mean, I expect those guys to score a lot of points. 
Yep, that gives you some nice stability for sure into the build. Um, the only running back since we took Judy that's gone off has been Ezekiel Elliott. Hopefully that continues to push the guys we have in the queue down a little bit. And you would somewhat expect by ADP that we would be able to get two out of our three targets here. We have pick 140 and 149. Marshawn Lloyd is 144. Kendra Miller is 145. Jalen Wright is 149. Any other elements? The other thing, you know, <laughs> Chardonnay is falling. I guess he's right now is just when he's gotten to ADP. Anything that we should be considering about this group other than taking them in the order that they're most likely to come off the board? None of them have buys that overlap with our two previous players. I'm sorry, no, Marshawn just the Char- Lloyd does. Just the Charbonnet Walker thing. I guess I'm not. We have JSN too. How much do we really want to invest in the Seahawks? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not both running backs would be my thought. I I don't think that the ADP value makes a huge difference in this particular range. And certainly I'm going to have a good mix of Charbonnet when he's not on Walker. I think I want my Walker teams yeah. to be pretty strong bets on him. So Rico Dowdle goes. He was one of the others ahead of Lloyd and Miller. Or the only other. Charbonnet and Dowdle were the two sort of cover players. Kendra Miller goes ahead of Charbonnet. I think it's Lloyd. We got Jefferson. Lloyd. Beautiful. I was hoping Miller might come all the way back around. Sharps goes one pick behind us. That's the drafter that got a couple of the falling values before us on the other way. He's having a nice draft. Now we're right back to this other question as well of if we only have the one tight end so far and we have a back stack, but not, we don't have teammates yet of Jaden Daniels. Are we looking at the tight end there and where would we basically would we select him in the same sort of situation that we did last time? I think so. I mean, I would make the same case. This just gets back to, we were joking during the second stream about, you know, we keep taking the same guys and are we worried about being so concentrated? I mean, I think if it's the right pick, you make the pick. Like our last draft was a CD lamb team. Um, or our first draft was our last draft was a Jamar chase team with Debo Samuel. This is a Justin Jefferson team with who was our second round pick. I can't even remember Brandon. Ayuk. No, we didn't take Ayuk, but he Nico. was available. Nico. Nico. We went Nico over Ayuk. That's right. So, it, I mean, it's a completely different build, but if you believe that taking an unstacked Jaden Daniels makes sense and then playing that through Senna later, like, then yeah, I'm I'm there for that. Although we only have three running backs this time. I think we had at least four last time, Sean. If you want to take Jalen Wright this time, who did make it back. Last time you were a little bummed we didn't get him. I'm totally fine with that. But it does make tight end two maybe a, a punt situation. Because we mentioned S- Sanat and Musgrave both are going to go, probably. Yeah, we just, we don't, sorry, we, I, <laughs> We just don't have any other good options at tight end, and it's yeah. such a good fit. Let's go that route. We'll we'll have chances to get Jalen Wright. He is the third stringer. There's no huge need to be jumping in there to draft him super enthusiastically ahead of guys like Ray Davis or Kamani Vital, even though he does have more upside than those players. But if anything, they might fit this roster even a tad bit better it is something too where having Kenneth Walker there does give you some flexibility when you get on a team like this that doesn't have much running back value because on this one we we made the choice to go with Mitchell and Judy where previously we have loaded up at running back and it gives you a little bit of a feel for what the trade-offs are. Yeah, but I'm totally comfortable with having these three running backs through the 13-14 turn. We have Kenneth Walker, Jalen Warren, and Marshawn Lloyd. We don't have a lot of depth there. The team that won the regular season 
million dollars in the in best ball mania last year was a zero rb build and the thing that really stuck out to me was that even though it was a zero rb build the top running backs they took in those middle rounds weren't even their highest scoring running backs it was Raheem Mostert in like round 15 and Kyron Williams in round 18 or, you know, they had both those guys in the very late rounds. They had another couple. I mean, they contributors everywhere. That's how you win the million dollar, you know, regular season prize. But I think it had like, like an AJ Dillon pick in the middle round, like as like one of the top running backs. If I, if I remember right, it had something in there that was like, this was one of the running backs you spent the most draft capital on which is just to to emphasize and drive home that you don't actually have to spend draft capital on running back sometimes. You know what I mean? Like if, if, if Vidal is right, if Irving is right, if those guys, and they can be, and they can be in a way that you can't be at other positions. Vidal goes one pick ahead of us here. We're back up. I'm totally fine taking a walker and taking those guys in earlier rounds, but I mean, it's fine to just backload your running backs in always be taking them in rounds 15 and 16. Like I'm, I'm okay with it. Yeah. And as you mentioned, it was disappointing to not get that good value on Kamani vital there. It would have been fun, especially because that would have balanced out our earlier pick today of JK Dobbins. Both of those guys in terms of vital and Irving, I think have a great chance to actually be the starter by mid season. So I love that element of it but one of the things i've been saying is that if we get powerful enough at receiver that we don't need to go to eight and certainly this receiver group does look very powerful and yet luke mccaffrey is he someone that at pick 173 his adp is 178 would you be leaning his direction over a tyrone tracy or do we want to execute what we talked about as being kind of a running back cliff after Tracy is gone? That's a really good question. Because I like McCaffrey a lot, and I do think you could make a strong case for him here to double stack Daniels. But Tracy is sort of the RB5. I, I mean, I think we, like I was just saying, I think you can keep pushing running back. I think a guy you haven't starred when you've been going through this in the last couple of drafts is Damian Pierce. Like, I think it's weird that he goes as late as he does. And we have the little Nico thing. Like, I mean, you're always down to bet against Joe Mixon. <laughs> I definitely am. I definitely you you am. put Khalil Herbert in there. I think both him and Roshan Johnson are, are viable plays. Yeah, let's play McCaffrey here. Um, I was just talking about the DeAndre Swift stuff, but that's like largely about the situation in Chicago. I also think Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson are very nice values. As far as guys that are probably going to play some, probably going to get some, um, production and they're in an offense that is that is good and um, they go so late because people don't know who the RB2 is what if DeAndre Swift misses time he's done that in a lot of, of the seasons of his career um, you're going to have those two guys playing as the main guys I mean it's there's there's certainly upside scenarios there particularly if you think that the bears can be good, you know, if their passing game can be good and open up some running holes and some of that stuff, which I think it's going to be hard for them to not be good with those three receivers. And this all comes back to me probably being higher than ever, like than than anyone on their three receivers, like higher than market on each of the three independently. And so then I think the trio is probably better than they actually are. <laughs> No, I, I, yeah. One of the reasons that I am not that excited about Swift is that despite being previously a pretty huge Swift fanatic, he disappointed last season and his backups are good. And if you have two different backups, then if you think about last year, you mentioned the thing with Miles Sanders where Chuba played pretty well or was superior. Chuba had played pretty well the previous season between Herbert and and Johnson, are we confident that like one of those guys won't actually jump up and just look really good for the coaching staff? So I, I certainly agree with you there. We now have moved into a situation where we do need to take yet another running back. Certainly our receiver position is set. We could stop at the two 
tight ends. But Ben, we only have the one QB. We have interesting options late, given that we have neighbors, we have JSN, and obviously we have Justin Jefferson at the top. And I don't think we have to make the pick right here. It's just something that we want to keep an eye on. We only have the four running backs. And so if we're going to go to a three QB build, we only have three picks left. We already have eight receivers. We can't can't add anything to stack up like a late, like New England. If it's not already stacked, we're kind of screwed. I, I mean, I think I'm just Daniel Jones again. Same thing that we did in like round 16 last time. Oh, you like fields in this type of build. I do. We can we can take that risk later. Is So you had mentioned Bigsby earlier as a possibility. I put Pierce and Johnson and Herbert all in there. Audric Estime is also interesting. You mentioned how much you like Javante Williams. I also like him a lot. I am nervous again with him coming off the bad year and them adding two guys. I kind of think that Blake Watson is the player to pick, but he's not, I mean, he doesn't, he's not currently in the mix, at least by ADP. We'll see where he ends up going. Is Estime somebody that you like in? I mean, I worry about him not catching any passes in college and the, the... and you're like, that's my whole thesis is that they're going to throw a bunch right. of back. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. <laughs> and, and Peyton used to have the roles in new Orleans, that were very defined. I wrote about this at Rotoviz when I was coming up that he would have guys every year that got a lot of rushing, like a, a pounder that as part of his three back system that would get some rushing work, but not catch any passes. It was Kyrie Robinson. It was Chris Ivory. It was early career. Mark Ingram. It was Mike Bell for a little bit of a stretch. Um, I just, Estime seems to fit that. I, I, I don't want to be too like um, precise with how I think his running back usage from the Saints is going to carry over. So I'm definitely willing to take some shots on Estime. It would be really annoying to be directionally accurate on the on the Broncos running back value and not have any exposure to a guy with a, over 200 ADP that is the only other like bigger back that can even really factor in um in in and doing all of the things that Javante does. I mean, like I, I think Blake both Blake Watson and Jaleel are I mean Samaj Piran's the other one, but a lot of people seem to think he's going to get cut. So yeah, I would be fine taking some some estimate just to get some exposure. Um but I I worry about his usage and I'm so I'm I'm thus not very excited. <laughs> so you wrapped it all the way back around to, oh, and then he does go. So we don't get that option. Well, it's Bigsby season, man. You said he was uh, Zach Charbonnet, but 90 rounds later. Yeah, and we didn't take Charbonnet in this draft. So we will go Bigsby. That, I think, Those big works pick. nicely. It's one of those things just emotionally. You're like, anytime you take the guy off of a player you love, it does make you a little bit nervous. <laughs> but the, e the ETN Bigsby thing? Yeah. It, I, that's it. That's what I'm saying with Javante and Estime right now. I'm just like, yeah, no, it can't be Estime because I, I want it to be Javante Williams. It's going to be Blake Watson. So <laughs> get, your, get your exposure before he does... I knew you were going to find a way to twist a knife there. I didn't realize you were going to go right back to Blake Watson for it. I mean, he's small though, right? Uh, he's I mean, not huge, huge, but he's... He's not Pierre Thomas. I'm looking for Pierre Thomas. I don't know. I put him in the queue just to remind people that he exists and I've been talking about him. I put Garendo in. I think that he's going to end up as the most exciting backup there for San Francisco. I don't want to jinx. Let's see where we are. Share this other tab. Oop, that's not the tab. Um, oops. <laughs> I, I broke it. 
<laughs> Starts having technical difficulties. I wonder who we're going to wind up with in the 18th round when he accidentally has all these technical difficulties. Um, it could be anyone. <laughs> It'll be somebody. Uh, somebody that makes a lot of sense that it was an accident. accident. Oh, there we go. He's back up. Ben also. What about DJ Chark? In, I don't uh, know if you realize, but Clyde edwards alaire is back on the Chiefs. I don't care. <laughs> I, I like think, DJ Chark a lot. I don't think that – does he fit this team in some way? No, he just went. I wanted to ask you because oh. I took him in the 18th the other day. I wanted to ask you if you liked him a lot still because you, you've been in on him. He's going to lead the Chargers he, in receiving. He's a reasonable pick in the 18th round for sure. Uh, I think you got to go fields. You've been trying to take him in all three of our drafts. He made it all the way back to the 18th round. I'm concerned about the total games played from Jaden Daniels and Daniel Jones as our only two quarterbacks. So we got to at uh, least is, like. Yeah, this is my favorite. My favorite, favorite QB room. We have Jaden Daniels, Daniel Jones, Justin Fields. Then we get this team into the playoffs, and who is going to be able to match the hybrid scoring power of those three stars? Yeah, that's fun. I mean, I, I have not really been as in on your fields love, but I think this is where you take him. So let's let's recap this team. We get Jane Daniels, Daniel Jones, and Justin Fields. We get Kenneth Walker and Jalen Warren early, then Marshawn Lloyd, who we took on all three drafts today, Bucky Irving, and Tank Bigsby. Only five running backs in this one. One of them, Bigsby, pretty late. We went more receiver heavy in this build. It's a pitts Sinat tight end thing. And then at receiver, Justin Jefferson, Nico Collins, Malik Neighbors, T. Higgins, Jackson Smith, and Jigba was our only receiver from round five through round nine, four non-receiver picks in that range. 80 Mitchell and Jerry Judy in 10 and 11 and Luke McCaffrey in 15 to finish off our, our wide receiver builds uh, and also give us a little bit of a double stack there on Washington. So it's fun. It's a fun team. And so Ben, I don't know that I mentioned this at the time, but the Mitchell selection as well was looking forward to what did happen, which was Daniel Jones to go with Malik neighbors. The Colts do have the giants in week 17. And while I would kind of expect the hybrid QBs to be the stars in that game and fuel the shootout, if there's somebody who could get over the top, Yep. and score the long touchdown to fit into the lineup and also fuel what, again, might be kind of a weird <laughs> shootout there between the Colts and the Giants. I mean, certainly if you're picking the Giants. You're telling a, a story. Team, yeah. And so yeah. that was one of the reasons. I don't know if I mentioned at the time. That's one of the reasons why I did want Mitchell when he was kind of a, a pick that worked otherwise. I'm glad that we have that with this team right now. If Mitchell, I mean, the story you're telling is, is A.D. Mitchell 80 yard touchdown in the first quarter helps push push Daniel Jones and Malik neighbors forward. I mean, yeah, he's the big athletic dude. That's going to be run routes downfield, taking out Pierce's job. Anthony Richardson hits him for a big play early and we're in business. That game shoots out a little bit because of, because of 80 Mitchell. Love it. Maybe he does it twice in the first half. Let's get two long touchdowns from 80 Mitchell. It makes perfect sense. I mean, I think it makes that that's the role he plays in the offense, as you just described. It does fit the build. A little AD Mitchell, Malik Neighbors rookie late season showcase. Some big plays on both sides. I, I I dig it. I dig it. This is another fun team. We had three good drafts today, Sean. Really hammered some of the uh values that we that we really like, the Marshawn Lloyds. The JSNs, I think he was also in all three drafts. A um, couple Jaden Daniels teams with with Ben Sinnott in, on both. Definitely some similarities through our different drafts. I think we got Bucky Irving on two of them as well in the later rounds. He's a fun play. I like the way they all came together. 
Yeah, and I, I one of the things I always push back on a little bit, not against any individual person, but just generally speaking, is this idea of backstacking with, or I mean, sorry, game stacking without getting the guys that you actually want. One of the reasons that I was excited to reach there on Kyle Pitts in round five was that that set up what we wanted to do with the Washington Commanders and Jaden Daniels in order to get that game game stack or that group game stack. So being able to get Washington Atlanta set up, being able to get the Giants Colts set up, and then to have such a, a fun team overall. And one of the things that you said going in with that first pick of Justin Jefferson that we didn't need to build around him. Otherwise, that turned out to be true. I really like this squad. The other thing I just realized we did in all three was Malik Neighbors. And we did Daniel Jones in two as well. Um, yeah, fun, fun draft. A lot of uh, e- exposure to players that are guys that I want to get exposure to. <laughs> to, yeah, to this, was, about it. this was a blast. Make sure you let us know what we did well, what you want to see more of. If you think we made any huge mistakes, you can also note that. But this has been a really fun episode of Stealing Bananas. If you're listening to the full audio, make sure you're getting in there and subscribing to Ben's new YouTube channel, Stealing Signals. He's going to hit 1,000 subscribers very, very quickly. We want that to happen by the time that you are listening to this. So go over there, sign up for that. Maybe you can be the 1,000th person if he hasn't already blown by it. We'd also love to have you subscribe to the Rotoviz Best Ball Banana Stand feed where you get the audio of the drafts that I do with Pete. Make sure you're checking out Ship Chasing. I know you're doing that. Colin and I would love to have you over at Rotoviz Overtime. Ben Connor O'Driscoll has a great article out. Blair's about to have some great articles out. I should have my priority targets out. And Jake Bose is going to have some cool content you had mentioned that you have a few pieces in the works as well. Yeah. Stuff over at Stealing Signals. Um, the big one coming up is a concept I'm calling the perfect storm candidates for monster 2024 seasons. That's the title. It's, you know, looking at sort of a kind of a projections based mindset, but looking at the, not the median outcomes and all of these little things. I think a lot of the conversations we're having at this time of year in the fantasy industry, not so much with you, Sean, on ceiling, but you know, as our conversations are always a little bit different than that, but a lot of the conversations I see are about the, you know, the, the, the most likely outcomes and little, um, disagreements on usage and role and, uh, most of that just winds up not mattering. It's kind of just like uh, fighting about the small victories. We're trying to find the big ones. Um, what I'm trying to write about in this this piece and this concept is low probability events, but the the ones that you would define as sort of like upside, the ones that can be monster league winning outcomes. Some things that I think where there are these perfect storm elements, a lot of things moving in the same direction. We've talked a lot about them. Uh, we've talked about all, some of them on, on the shows. Um, the, the, the Broncos running backs we've talked about, I think they could have just a, a truly absurd number of targets, like a really, really high number and really defining that and looking at their past. Sean, we talked a little bit about the, the pass rate for the chiefs, Right. And and what that actually means and looking at their history and how that, you know, really emphasizing that that's a different range of outcomes for that one team than the other 31 teams. A um, few more things like that. So uh, a fun piece, a fun kind of idea to, to try to look into. It's sort of like a, a bold predictions type concept. To try to look into these like upper 95th percentile outcomes. But what ones could really define uh, the 2024 season. I think you just got everybody very excited about that. Gives me chills to think about the upside scenarios for these guys that we're going to get this fault in order to get that. You've got to go over, you got to sign up for the best 
newsletter in the fantasy space, Stealing Signals. You'll also want to sign up for Stealing Lines. We'd love to have you join us over at Rotoviz. The coupon code is RV Radio 2024 at checkout for a 10% discount on your one year subscription. We appreciate everyone who is leaving the ratings and reviews across kind of the various projects that we're involved in, but it really does mean a lot to us. So if you get a moment and you want to uh, do something for us there, it, it does help a lot. Thank you so much. We love you. We'll talk to you soon.